look good. But I could get my fingers over the rim and get it down and down. And I look up and about the height of the basketball goal rim is a woman. So in my gazelle-like leaping <laughs> I left up and got the thing. Any other time it broke it into four pieces. Any other time. It snapped off just right. Just right. And it wasn't completely like papery, rotten. It had some heft to it. And I landed gently down, kind of like Spider-Man. <laughs> and I landed, and I got a Louisville slugger in my hand. I mean, it was heavy and long. And I stepped out boldly out from behind that tree and discovered one of the fundamental truths of bulls. Bulls don't give a shit if you got a baseball bat. <laughs> it would be a great story if I had been killed. It would be a great story if he had gored me and put me in the hospital. I'd be dining out on that right now. But instead, I hurt myself, you know, getting away from it. And I didn't like break anything, but I cut myself up, you know, pretty good. And you know, gravel does that to you. And so does tree trunks when you're hugging them. <laughs> and thank God, he, you know, he got bored after a while. What? Right, I still be there. <laughs> my brother Sam would be selling tickets. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's not the, that's not the bad part. A few weeks later, I get a call from my mama. You got to understand that my mama's never asked for anything in her life. Not for me. You have to force things on me. When her washing machine went bad, I bought her a new washer and dryer, and she said, there's no point in you doing that. That is, uh, <coughs> that other washing machine is just fine. You only had to bang the lid real hard eight or nine times to get it click on. You know, she doesn't want presents. When I got her a big screen TV, she told me that why would I do that when she only watches one channel? <laughs> the Western channel and the preaching channel, the inspiration channel, which she got because they showed the Virginian. <laughs> so she doesn't ask for anything. But this call, she said, Hi, the pasture looks so lonesome since we got rid of the, the bulls and we got rid of the cows too. Some of them. And I said, well, I'm sorry, Mama. Would you like me to get you some cattle to put in there? And she said, no. I've been thinking I'd like to have a couple of miniature donkeys. So <laughs> 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 well, I found this guy in Fairhope, Alabama, down on the coast, who, who raises miniature donkeys. I called him up. I said, I need two miniature donkeys. And he said, I got them. Didn't ask him how much they cost because if a regular size donkey <laughs> costs one hundred and seventy-five dollars, then wouldn't you figure that a fourth of that? <laughs> so, guy comes up with a trailer full of miniature donkeys, out trot Bucky and Mimi. <laughs> Mimi, while I'm petting Bucky, runs around behind me and bites me on the leader on my right leg. <laughs> Almost triples me. <laughs> but my mother is happy. She loves them. She calls them her babies. <laughs> But when I get on the plane, and that big guy sits next to me, <laughs> I can't tell him that I am a breeder of miniature donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I gave him my best squint. And I look him right in his eyes. I say, I'm a rider. <laughs> questions and you'll see that I don't answer questions the way that normal people do. I believe the new, new students who are taking literature classes should know, you know, this success and at this point all the students run out the door. Uh, yeah, y'all got great careers ahead of you. <laughs> what, the beer sales cut off around here? <laughs> <laughs> but I tell the young people that, that you know, there's really only one way to tell a story, and that's an imagery to tell in color. So when we answer questions at these things, I'm not going to tell them with yes, no, maybe. You know, I never really thought about that. I will tell them in color. Which is, you know, comes from my people. I come from the best storytellers on the planet. With all due respect to Kentucky, I come from the best storytellers on earth. I'm not saying I am. I'm the right candidate. But my uncles, there is a beauty in the language and how they tell a story. You go to a family reunion, and my uncle Bill, we call him Wild Bill because he, he was bored by working in a steel mill. You know, a place where they take boiling 200 gallon vats of molten iron that pass by your head four feet away. That bored him. <laughs> so he, he possess, repossessed cars on the weekend. He liked getting shot at. <laughs> He liked opening the door of a 1964 Chevrolet Biscayne and having a bulldog jump out. He liked that. And at a family reunion, he sat down beside me and he reached down and my, my uncles have big hands. You know, like my grandfather. They have my grandfather's hands. And if you think about it, when did our hands start getting little? You know what I mean? But think about your grandfather's hands. And, and you know, I got 13 year old girl hands. <laughs> my hands are smaller than yours. My hands are tiny. And uh, I ain't right. And he would reach down and he would clamp one of those gigantic hands on my knee that told you. You're not getting away until I'm through telling this story. <laughs> and he climbed that hand down and I asked him how he is. And he said, Did I ever tell you about the time I repossessed that car in East Jackson? He said, No, Bill, I don't think you did. He said, Yeah. You yeah, know, it's August and I, I got away with it pretty clean. And I got it home and the next day, you know, it's 114 degrees outside. The next day, I open up the door and I hear this hissing sound. And I thought, well, somebody's put a snake in here. And he runs his food, he can't find a snake, but he does see a bag, a diaper bag, and he goes rummaging through it and finds a baby bottle that's been sitting in a car for three days in 114 degree heat. So he picks it up to look at it. <laughs> and the nipple shot off and hit him in the eye. <laughs> Thus ends the highbrow literary. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so while he had me, he said, Did I ever tell you about that time that Mama, that would be Ava, my grandma, that Mama prayed the tornado away? And I said, No. And he said, Yeah, we were, we were living outside Rome, that big Rome, Georgia. <laughs> and uh, pre world traveler. <laughs> And he said, and he'd come up a cloud. And if you live in the deep south, there's one color that you don't want to see. Green. You don't want to see a green sky. And a tornado slipped out of those clouds like a worm out of a rotten apple. And my grandmother was home alone. My grandfather was purportedly out somewhere roofing a house, but he was actually in the mountains making liquor. And my grandma was there alone with all these children. And her children were like those Russian dolls that fit inside each other. <laughs> you know, there would be like a, 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 a one-year-old up to a 17-year-old. And they began to scream. Because this tornado is coming from the ridge line facing them, eating its way through the valley, and it's coming right out. And they're in a house that you could, you know, you could have held together with duct tape and been stronger. And the, those trees, you know, tornadoes don't necessarily snap trees off; they twist them. So you get this jagged, broken, but the sound it makes, the sound it makes is, is like, it's like a dynamite. And, and the babies are just in terror. And my grandma, Ava, Ava was a savant. She was well read in a time when people didn't read. And well read meant that she read her Bible frontwards, backwards, upside down, and sideways. And these children are screaming, and she knows <clears throat> this is the end. She can't really run from something like that. And there ain't, if you don't have a hole in the ground to crawl into, you can't really run from it. So the tornado creeps and gouges and roars, and babies scream, and Ava flung herself down on her knees on the dirt floor of that shack and began to pray. But she did not begin to pray as the Methodists do, or the Episcopalians. She began to pray the way the Congregational Holiness pray, the Pentecostals pray. And she thrust her skinny arms up to heaven and tears flowed down her face and she began to speak in tongues. She began to speak in the old language, in the language of Abraham. And the babies stopped screaming because this was a better show. <laughs> and they just look at her, you know, with her own tears, you know, on their face, and they they look at her and, and they're mystified. They've never seen anything like this. And I talked with her, I actually talked with her about that. You know, Ava would believe in her faith. She believed in deliverance. But she was also really smart. And she did not want her baby's last thoughts on this earth to be terror. So she delivered them from that. And the tornado, as tornadoes are wont to do, took a hard left turn. Missed them clean. And Ava got up off her knees, dusted off her apron, and looked at the children with great sincerity and said, I'll be goddamn, I thought he had us that time. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs>
Are you going to go mobile with a microphone? I'm going mobile with it. So just raise your hand if you have a question. We'll go by show of hands. And this young man looks pretty spry. <laughs> Here's one over here. Answering questions is a lot like uh, church. It's like when they give the altar call. Well, hell, everybody's scared to death. Ain't nobody going to go first. And then once they go first, it's the damn floodgate. <laughs> <laughs> so how do people in your family like being written about? How do they like your books? What do they say? What, what do they say? They range from uh, utterly unimpressed <laughs> to proud that somebody noticed. And nobody objects? Oh, yeah. I mean, I <laughs> It all depends on which branch of the family you're talking about. For instance, my, you know, my mama uh, was asked, what did you think about the book? And my mama told this reporter, said, um, I've just been walking around up here on this pedestal my son put me on trying not to fall off. <laughs> and, uh, but but she, she truly didn't see the big deal. Uh, she didn't understand, I think. You know, people always write a book. And, and she, I don't think she understood the, 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 the depth and breadth that that book would have. And then as she began to get mail, really sweet letters, then she began to realize that if it was so important to other people, if it was so important to other people, then maybe it was important to her. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, she was honored that I did it, but it seemed very personal to her between, you know, me and her. You know, my brother Sam, you know, it's funny, I, uh, I wrote in a magazine story that, you know, that, you know, how much I looked up to him and, you know, how much I admired him. And, and he told my, you know, he never said a word to me about any of that. He never said a word about anything I've ever read. But he told my mama, and he said, yeah, I guess I must have not done too bad a job, huh? You know. Um, uh, my aunts love the old stories of their people, their father. You know, I'm convinced now that the strongest thing in the world for a writer is, is not history. But simple nostalgia. History is what was. Nostalgia is what we wanted it to be. And the way we remember it. And I have to be careful at every step to write history flavored by nostalgia, not nostalgia framed by history. So I have to be careful with every step. And I think we, you know, we, we hold the history. We're writing about the Depression. We hold the dates. You know, if we are told a story like the one I told you all about, the, the tornado, you know, obviously that story never appeared in a social register. Poor people don't get written about in the newspaper unless they knock some rich guy off his horse. You know, they don't get written about unless they are in a stride and bust somebody's head, they don't get rid of the house, except in the cop briefs. And, you know, so these books were remarkable. I know that the thing I'm most proud of in my writing life is that they are remarkable for that. Uh, so they, yeah, I think they're mostly okay. And then you have the cousin. You know, you're going to do a talk in your hometown. The auditorium seats, a thousand, is sold out. And you go to your hometown and you show up and your cousin Carlos, we pronounce it Carlos, but it's actually Carlos, the only, only hillbilly boy in the foothills of the Appalachians named Carlos. <laughs> named because his daddy saw it on a crate of Mexican apples in 1932. <laughs> and, and Carlos, who's in a great document, in my work, comes, you know, hurrying up and says, I ain't gonna use his name. He says, your cousin fill in the blank. Says he's gonna meet you outside the auditorium and cut you. <laughs> what, what the hell are you doing with that? <laughs> so I said, well, 
well, why do you think we ought to do it? I mean, I don't really want to fight him out in front of the auditorium. You know, it'd be like in the movies where you take your coat off and wrap it around your free hand. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. And he said, well, we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll get the law. So I did my talk in front of all my kin folks with five or six of the biggest police officers I've ever seen <laughs> ringing me off the stage. There's like one here and one there and one over. And I'm talking about weightlifting, you know, wrestles. You know, big alarm about that big. And, you know, I mean, he didn't even show up to cut me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It all depends on who you ask. I can't tell you in, in uh, going on 18, 19 years of writing about my people, I've had I've had twice face to face had someone tell me that they wish I hadn't done. And those were uh, distant relatives. Yeah. So I'm, I can live with that. You know, if, if it was embarrassing, if my life had been greatly embarrassing, when people write memoir, they always, you know, they, they always ask me, how did you get away with that? Well, I got away with it if you'll look at the books. There is no great shame in that. Look, you know, losing your Losing your family to a bottle? Well, that happens every other house in a mill village. You know, losing your family to that? Um, you know, working in the dirt? Ain't nothing to be ashamed of in working in the dirt. Um, you know, raising your children by yourself because you married a sorry man? There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's the opposite, isn't it? I mean, isn't it the opposite of shame? But I think a lot of people, especially people from, I don't want to say upper classes, but you know, with more community standing. Look, there ain't nobody in Calvin County, Alabama ever going to name a street for me. <laughs> that is never going to happen. We're not the kind of people that have a street name for them. They chained my daddy to the ground with eight feet of logging chain at the intersection of the busiest streets in Jacksonville, Alabama. Chained him to the ground, handed him a slang blade to shame him. Um, they're not going to name a street for us. I mean, don't have them. But people from the upper classes, you know, they're worried about what will happen. You know, what will happen and what I if I do this memoir, what ain't pity pat, you know, will just be scandalized. And I tell them, then maybe you shouldn't write a memoir. I actually had a lady look at me, stood up in the crowd, just like this, and said, Mr. Bragg, I can't do an upper class southern accent, maybe. Mr. Bragg, I just want you to know that I too have suffered. Why, I have never been the same since in my cotillion, Big Daddy would not buy me my potty dress. <laughs> I don't quite know how to answer that. Anyway, next. See, it takes me a damn long time. It does, uh, yeah. Um, I just finished reading a biography of Jeremy Lewis. Okay, thank you. I am, I am old enough to have grown up listening to and hearing about that living legend. And I know you spent a year or two. I spent two summers doing the interviews, but I spent three years off and on, you know, going back to him and 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 trying to get him to give me enough stuff to write a book and not shoot me, and I'm not kidding. Well, I remember you said he had in the bedroom there was one gun, maybe two, and a very mean little dog that was pretty vicious. Yeah, unfortunately, the vicious dog was a chihuahua. <laughs> uh, you know, you ain't live until you have been bit by Jerry Lee Lewis's chihuahua. But, you know, he, he shot his bass player 
in the chest with a 357. And he said he didn't mean to, but that didn't make the bass player any less shocked. <laughs> you know? and, and when I got there, I mean, one of the first things that happens is he shows me a you know, brush steel 357 Magnum under his pillow. So I had to conduct those interviews knowing that when I made him mad, and we're not talking about us. We're not talking about us. We're talking about Jerry Lee Lewis, who is, I'm convinced, is from an altogether different genetic makeup. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I was, I'm not going to say I scared you because, see, this is the truth. I walked in there. He, we had a conversation. He was in terrible physical condition. He had had pneumonia. He had pneumonia like three times in the course of this book. He had shingles. He had uh, chronic arthritis in his back that prevented him from even sitting at the piano for more than a few minutes. He ultimately had nerves clipped in his back so that he could stand and sit on the piano bench. Because the day that he can't sit on the piano bench will be the end of him. So, you know, it was a, I mean, it was fascinating. And I sat there in the dark of that bedroom and he took me off down the path and he talked about making Elvis cry talked about, you know, uh, setting the piano on fire, piss off Chuck Berry. And, and he talked about fist fights and knife fights and gun fights and great darkness. Talked about landing planes where you could rake the pills out of the shag carpet and get the whole rolling stones high. And, uh, he talked about all that. And, uh, and I was honored to do it. You know, it, it, you know, Jimmy had done anything I hadn't done. He's just a whole lot better at it. <laughs> and, and he, yeah, you know, it was funny. It was uh, when they asked you to do it. I thought, no way in hell. But then I got to thinking, how can this be dull? <laughs> how can this be dull? And the bottom line is, if you write for a living. Dull, and Jerry Lee understands this, dull is the dream killer. Dull is a dead field to walk in. And Jerry Lee hates dull, and so do I. So we got along pretty good, actually. Got along pretty good. Someone else? Do you think your mother is actually real proud of the, what the right you do? You know, I think she's proud of me sometimes, and sometimes she doesn't quite know what to think. Uh, I think sometimes she thinks that I might have been dropped on my head once or twice too often. My aunt Sue, when I was a baby, was rocking me, and I flew off her shoulder and hit, landed on the hearth of the house on my, on my head. And, and for a quarter, I'll let you touch it. <laughs> But I have an edge knot on my head that I've had since I was born. And, um, and she attributes much of what I say <laughs> to that injury. But she's, you know, I think she's proud of it. I also think she is a little bit mollified. That's probably a good word. That's a pretty good word, isn't it? But, you know, and I think she... Um, I think she understands that it's important, like I said earlier, she understands this is important to other people. And uh, when she, when uh, this, when, when she was being interviewed, and my mom didn't do me, but when she was being interviewed by this reporter, um, the reporter asked her, and I was sitting in the room and said, Miss Brad, what was the best day of your life? And you know, I got all puffed up because I knew she was going to say, well, it was the day that you know, my boy wrote that book about me. Or it was the day that, uh, that he won that prize. Or, you know, something like that. And instead, she thought a minute and she said, I think it was the birth of my first son. <laughs> and the reporter, being an excellent reporter, said, well, tell me about it. 
Why was it so important to you? And my mama thought a minute and she said, We know I never did have a dog. <laughs> I never did have a dog. And, you know, then the next thing you know, here's this perfect, beautiful thing. This perfect, beautiful thing. And I didn't have anywhere to take you because my daddy he was sorry. And, uh, and she couldn't go home to him. He'd been vacant, absent. Daddy didn't see any of us for almost a year after we were born. And, uh, he, uh, you know, Mama took the baby, as all mamas since the dawn of time have, took the baby home to her mama and dad's house. And, and the next morning, and this is the story she's telling me, this report. The next morning, my grandfather wakes up and says, Margaret, you kept us all, kept us up all night long talking to that blame boy. And uh, the reporter, being a good reporter, said, well, what were you saying to the boy? And Mama said, I just kept looking at him and saying over and over again, all night long, you're mine. And, uh, you know, my mama thinks that important things are important. And books are, well, they're made out of paper. You know, how flimsy a form for a little is paper when you got minutes like that. So, so if you had to pick one chapter in the book, which one would be your favorite and which one means the most to you? Why? That's hard. Um, I think I think if I had to go with something to just say, you know what, I'm done, I think it would probably be that introduction to shouting. But that's kind of a no-brainer, you know. Uh, as I'm writing about um, as I'm writing about my grandfather at the end of Avis Man. Um, there was a lamp that got passed down generationally in my family. There's a, a kerosene lamp. And my mama wound up with it. They gave it to the one who needed it the most. And mama was raising these children by herself and her sisters all married, you know, good men. You know, good men. And her brothers were strong, flawed, but strong. So they gave her this lamp to, to keep. And, and she had talked about it in the writing of, of several books. And, and at the end of Ava's Man, I was in a downstairs bathroom. And I look, and behind a bunch of crates, and my mama don't throw out grocery bags, so there's like 400 paper grocery bags. And there's that lamp, you know. So when I wrote Davis Man, I, I, you know, we talked about the lamp, and, and my aunt Gracie Juanita had, had said of her her father, my grandfather that I never saw, had said, um, I can't really explain what it was like. You know, we lived in these dark places so far back in the woods. There was no light. I mean, the night came down to a lid on a box. And there would be screaming animals, and there would be just, they would just be terrified. Storms would shake the houses. And she said, then Daddy would come in from work. And we'd be standing there in that fedora, brown fedora, and overalls. And she said, he'd open the door and he would step in, and it was like the sky cleared. And um, and when I wrote the ending of that book, I, I evoked that lamp. And I asked my mother, I said, well, are you going to keep it? Or? She said, no, I'll give it away. Somebody will want it. Somebody will always want it. You know, somebody will always need it. 
And I said, you know, the weather here is worse. But, you know, the weather is worse. People, old people believe that the weather is worse now than it used to be. And, you know, some people say it's global warming. Some people, like my grandma, say it's because those men walked on the moon. And messed everything up. And, <laughs> and I think we end that book by saying, or maybe it's just because there's no one left to clear the sky. So that sums up the way my people feel about their people. So, you know, I mean, that's a hard question to answer because, you know, that'll change day by day. You know, like if you asked me that question, you know, five years from now, it would probably be different. That's a good one, though. Who else? Yes, yes, ma'am. If your father was alive, do you think he would be happy? Daddy liked being fancy. You know, Daddy liked, you know, Daddy wore Palm Beach suits. Now, those of you who know what that means know that Palm Beach suits do not mean they came from Palm Beach. <laughs> you know, they were sewed in Talladega. And, you know, and here too. And they sold them in too. You know, so, yeah, that's what Palm Beach suit was. And, and he wore white suits with cherry red neckties and a red carnation. And he was a mill village boy. Didn't have two nipples to run together. But he would either steal or I won't say rob because I don't think Daddy did that. But he he come up with enough money fighting chickens or betting on dogs to get money to fill his car up with gas or put five gallons in it and, and buy that stuff. And if it were not for that, his propensity to enjoy being a fancy guy, then I would say he probably would not care. But Daddy would have enjoyed the celebrity. Yeah, Daddy would have enjoyed the tiny little, you know, being a book writer has the kind of celebrity that, let's face it, ain't nobody going to ask me if I wanted to pick all the brown M&Ms out of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That ain't going to happen. But the nice people that do ask me to come to talk, and I do it somewhere every week, maybe sometimes a couple of times a week. Um, I think Daddy would have loved that. He'd have loved coming up here with me. And and he'd sit there and, and, and at some point during the talk he'd raise his hand and say, Now what really happened? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a really hard one to answer too, because you know you, you just can't put a you just can't put with any certainty uh, a notion or an inclination on the dead. You just can't do it. You know. That's a good question, though, too. Yes, sir. Well, Rick, I know you've written hundreds, if not thousands, of newspaper stories. Mm -hmm. Does anyone stand out above the rest for some reason? Um, the Oklahoma City bombing um, was heartbreaking. That's where I lost my uh, objectivity. You know, I needed, uh, I needed Timothy McVeigh to die. Uh, I, I'm, I don't believe in the death penalty. I'm a good, don't nobody stone me, but, you know, I'm kind of progressive. <laughs> and and I, I don't, I, I never really believed in it. I think as soon as they start electrocuting as many rich guys as they do poor guys, then I'll believe in the death penalty. But that ain't really going to happen. So, so I, I wanted McVeigh to die, and that flew in the face of what I thought I was. But sometimes evil is so dense and dark that the only way to respond to it is with a, an equal evil. And I know that, that purists will say, well, that makes us just like them. No. Not if your evil is specific. And his evil killed babies in the nursery. So he needed to die. So that one stands out. No, I didn't write happy stuff. You know, I cannot remember five happy stories. 
and I did is do stuff like that. I, I think I did. Uh, I got lucky. I went to Haiti and wrote about not just dying and killing, but killing and dying with magic mixed in. Yeah, the, the, the old uh, voodoo priests that were aligned to the, the old Tom Tom Akut actually wanted to turn me into a goat. <laughs> uh, and I lived there, you know, three and a half months, uh, you know, killing every day. And uh, I walked down the street in uh, Pakistan where you could buy an artificial limb a machine gun or a diamond in the same store and ran for my life to a place called the Bazaar of the Storytellers with Bin Laden's people jumping through flames to prove their love of Bin Laden and I was running and my interpreter was running beside me and every like fifth step he'd go woo and I'd go what and he'd say this is problematic <laughs> Problematic. Uh, so there were, you know, the dangerous assignments stick out, but there were not that many of them when you think about the career overall. I, I did four happy assignments. I, uh, Gene Roberts, the great uh, newspaper editor, their uh, famous icon, uh, set me on the eating tour of North Carolina barbecue. <laughs> and, and one day, I decided. Uh, I wanted to go to Las Vegas, and I asked, and I, but I needed a story. And I had heard somewhere that, that the Las Vegas showgirl was in danger. <laughs> <laughs> that changing oars had, had, had done away with most of the old kind of X-rated, they're not X-rated, just not nakedness. They're views. You know, eight foot tall naked people. You know? and, and, and I thought, well, by God, that's a cultural phenomenon. I didn't even know right about it. So I went to my editor and I said, uh, the Las Vegas showgirl is disappearing. <laughs> he just gave me that look like, no, oh, hell. And he said, uh, and you want us to let you go on our nickel to gamble and write about naked people. And I said, no, I want you to let me go to plumb the depths of a cultural phenomenon <laughs> and come back and write something about it. It's true, I saw it on PBS. <laughs> and all you had to do was say PBS and you're gone. <laughs> So I went to Las Vegas and I won nine hundred dollars on the way to the fax machine. <laughs> it was a good trip. <laughs> so you know, I never had a lot of happy stories. But I found a few here and there. Someone else, and y'all now remember, you're gonna be my timekeeper. Okay, so if your butt start getting numb out there, it's her fault. Yes, you read. Yes, sir. <laughs> I wanted to ask about a happy story. Uh, that was about Osceola McCarty. Oh, that's. You know, I can't even make. I can't even act a fool in talking about Miss McCarty. Th those of you who don't know, that she was a, uh, a washerwoman in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, <laughs> and she, uh, you know, she never took a vacation. She took one vacation in her whole life. She went to Niagara Falls. And she didn't like it because the noise scared her. And she was a little big. I mean, she was tiny. Debbie, you would make two of Miss McCarthy. And, and she was just, man, she was just humble and sweet. And, and she took in laundry. You know, as my mother took in laundry. And she took her, she saved that money up, you know, one dollar bills silver, nickel signs and quarters. And when she got into her 80s, I think she was 86 maybe, she knew that 
she did not have much longer. She had health problems. And, and um, so she gave it all away, $150,000 to uh, the college there. And I asked her, you know, sitting in her house, I said, why? And she said, so the children don't have to work as hard as I do. So yeah, that's, that, you know, my hell. You know, you can't. I can't even, I can't even crack a joke. You know, people do ask me, they say, uh, they quote lines from that story, not because I'm such a good writer, but because that story touches your heart. And, and, and I said that, you know, she's so humble that she cuts the toes out of her shoes, you know. My, my Aunt Juanita lived her life, and you know, she is so, as I would describe this little bitty tiny black woman, in my mind, I was seeing this tall, blonde, white woman taking in laundry, see them cutting the toes out of those dime store chin shoes, you know, so that, you know, when they, when their toe poke through. Uh, so I, I think as I wrote that story of her, I was actually kind of seeing, certainly seeing her, but also seeing my own people. And, um, and, you know, she only turned that condition on when company comes. And there's a, her Bible was completely, all the pages had come unglued. But she just, you know, stuffed them back in there and tried to bind the sign with a scotch tape. Well, you know, because you're a writer, you don't say bound the, the sign with scotch tape. You say bound her Bible with scotch tape to keep Corinthians from falling out. <laughs> and and people have asked me at every stop, why Corinthians? <laughs> and I tell them the truth because I could not spell Deuteronomy. Someone <laughs> <laughs> else, do we have time for a few more? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, in regard to your comments on uh, Timothy McVeigh, I was wondering, uh, I understand what motivated him was the uh, shooting of uh, some of the Wheeler family at Ruby Ridge and also uh, Waco, um, I guess about 80 people who died and uh, 20 of them were children. Uh, would you share his um, concerns about the government action as you go? Yeah, and, and I realize that I will meet with some disagreement here. I think that is utter and complete horseshit. I think that he killed those people. I don't think he was deep enough. He, he joined the Ku Klux Klan to get a t-shirt to get a t-shirt. He was not a smart man. He was not a political activist. He was lonely and lost and rejected. And we have tried to imbue him with some sense of, 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 of not good, fighting back against an oppressive federal government. I talked to people who spent a lot of energy time with him. But mostly I talked to his victims. And I read 6,000 pages of everything that I could find on who he was. He killed those people for fashion. For fashion. So he could wear the t-shirt and go to the rallies. He killed those people for fashion. Out of all the people that you've written about, other than your own family, which person did you actually like the most? Well, I fell in love a few times in the past. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I liked, uh, I'm telling you, I, I missed. I didn't get him. I always wanted to interview Dolly Parton. You know? I love Dolly. I mean, I love Dolly tremendously. And, and I never got to talk to her. You know? Uh, 
no, it's, trust me, it's too late. Now, you know, now I'd have to say, Miss Parton, can I interview you because I've always wanted you? Know, I can't do that. Oh, sure. uh, people that I'm not, people that I'm not related to. Miss McCarty was probably the most joyous human interview I ever did. Uh, uh, yeah, I interviewed, uh, I'll tell you the three that scared me more in violence. I interviewed a suspected terrorist and mass murderer, suspected, named Orlando Bosch, who was uh, rumored to have, alleged to have blown a plane out of the sky in an anti-Castro attack. Um, uh, and I, you know, as I was talking to him, I asked him, Mr. Bosch, and, you know, what do you dream about? Because he'd always denied <clears throat> the killing. And he said, I dream about bodies in the water. Uh, and I interviewed uh, Nick Sutton. <laughs> That's a scary man. <laughs> <laughs> I sat across from him doing a Sports Illustrated story. It was actually one Sports Illustrated. We won an award. It was a uh, in the 60-year history of their magazine, it's one of their top 60 stories. And I don't know how, because Nick don't answer questions. He has an answer for everything. It's the same answer. And it's, you know, we got to believe in the process, you know, that kind of thing. But he was a scary little man. He, you know, he sat there next to me, and, and when he finally smiled, it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> You know who I probably enjoyed, uh, probably enjoyed more than than anybody is uh, when I used to cover shop.